Dr. Sastrawan is a postdoctoral research fellow in the social history of Indonesia at the École Française de Extreme Orient. And do we have you there, Jara? In Sydney, I believe you're doing as well. That's right. Here I am. Thank you very much, Jara. Please begin. Thank you very much, Adam, and thank you everyone for putting together this fascinating workshop. I looking forward very much uh, to continuing to learn from all the different perspectives that are being presented here today. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm, <clears throat> I'm dialing in from Sydney, Australia, and I'm uh, currently situated on the lands of the Garigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, one of the Aboriginal Australian nations that have been custodians of this continent for 65,000 years. So I acknowledge their elders, pay respect to their elders and their ongoing ownership of this land. Allow me to share my screen. Well, let me first set up the PowerPoint. Uh, so I hope that my screen is visible, uh, that it's and that it's on the first slide, so please let me know if it's not. Today, I'd like to present work that is uh, in collaboration with two of my colleagues, um, Arlo Griffiths uh, and Echo Bastiawan, uh, both of whom I've worked for several years in the field of old Javanese epigraphy. Uh, and I acknowledge that the, the responding for the research on the Sangoran inscription that we have conducted last year and this year is uh, funded by the ERC Synergy Project Dharma. What I would, what we would like to focus on uh, this morning in Scotland, this evening in Sydney, is the Sanguran inscription as, uh, in terms of its contents primarily, uh, but also then the significance of those contents. So I won't be speaking specifically about the colonial context of the discovery of Sangharad inscription, uh, nor its transportation to Scotland, where it now resides. Um, I have no doubt that we will have plenty of interesting discussions about that story later on today. What I'd like to emphasize is that the Sangharad inscription was created in the 10th century uh, in order to serve a specific political and social and economic function at that time. And that in order to access and to learn about that function, we need to read the inscription and read it again. So I want to draw attention to the fact that the inscription, though it has been published before, remains very much unfinished business in terms of its text, in terms of its translation and its interpretation. And in the process of that, I want to talk about some of the new possibilities that are available to us now with certain kinds of digital imaging, which are becoming more and more uh, available, more and more convenient, and what those new possibilities allow us to learn further about Javanese history. Uh, and then finally, with the, uh, with the cultural, the broader heritage implications of this kind of approach to Javanese inscriptions in particular, but written heritage documents in general. So the Sangharan inscription is a stone slab that's been written upon on three sides, as uh, you saw in the previous slide. It was issued in the early 10th century. We believe that the place that it was issued is in the vicinity of the road between Malang and Batu. And shortly I'll talk about some of, some of our studies about where that site might be. We, we don't know for certain yet. The content of the inscription is a land grant, the function of which was to turn a specific village which already exist, existed at that time called Sangoran into a benefice, which means that the labor and income and the tax on that, uh, on that productivity that was previously allocated uh, to, we believe, uh, a, lo a, a wide range of, of officials, of state officials, was reallocated. And it was reallocated to the service of a devotional temple, which we believe was nearby uh, at 
place called Mananjong. And that temple was part of uh, the ritual religious life of the community of Smith. So what we have here is a document in which economic privileges and um, local political arrangements were being altered. And they were being altered in the name of the highest authority in the land, which at that time was a king called Wawa. But through close reading of the document itself and comparison with other similar inscriptions of the period, we get the strong impression that actually the person behind the document was most likely the chief minister uh, called Sindok. And there are a range of reasons why this was the case. Uh, Sindok, as uh, many people who will be familiar with this period of Japanese history will know, uh, in, the, in the subsequent year, so in 929, became king in his own right and ruled for uh, for over a decade and a half. So he was a very significant uh, political figure in his own right. What's important, though, about the, the inscription, which is often called a royal inscription because of the authority of Wawa, and, and in general, these, these inscriptions are called royal inscriptions, is that the bulk of the text actually pertains to local issues and local figures. So we see listed in great detail the very many local community people who are involved in the ceremony and the rituals connected to it. There's a very strong sense that grants of this kind in Java were primarily affairs of the local community in which the state was involved as a sort of uh, decision-making figure but nevertheless, that, that it was very important for as many uh, stakeholders as possible to be uh, to be involved. One of the reasons that this inscription is significant, despite the fact that it shares a lot of similarities with other similar documents of the time, is that it is the last known inscription before Sindok cam came to power. And in the conventional historiography of Java, this is the end of the major period periodization break between Central Javanese and East Javanese history, which also has implications for art history and other kinds of, um, of social history. So it stands on the precipice of a new era, uh, according to the conventional view, which is why it particularly deserves attention, apart from the fact, of course, that it is located in Scotland and it's a major uh, target or a major focus of repatriation discussions. The location of Sanguran, uh, that is the village that's mentioned in the text and therefore the most probable find spot of the stone, is known to be around Malang. Uh, so Raffles' original claim that it was found near Surabaya is, was, is incorrect and was actually known to be incorrect at the time originated through the agency of the regent of Malang, but as far as we've been able to tell, and we've had a lot of very kind assistance from staff at the British Library, particularly Dr. Neville Gallup, to track down exactly where the fine spot has been. Unfortunately, we haven't yet been able to find um, the British document that will tell us for sure. However, uh, through looking at one, archeological sites that are known, uh, in this region between Malang and Batu, which is uh, the sort of the vicinity in which we've been able to narrow down the, the search. And then by looking within the text of the inscription itself at the villages that are mentioned as being neighbors of Sanguran, we're able to draw a little bit of a net. So here is a uh, map of first the two sites in blue, the two um, candidate sites for where the inscription may have been found and therefore where Sanguran may have been uh, in the past. Unfortunately, there is no longer a village called Sanguran that we've been able to locate in modern times. At Pundam, uh, we have archaeological excavations, whereas at Gandat, we also have uh, a smaller number of, of archaeological material discovered, but also a community that has very much embraced an identity as being the fine spot of um, of the Sangaran inscription, and that's something which my colleague Echo has been working very closely on. But then these green spots are identifications that we've been able to make 
from the ancient names of villages mentioned in the inscription with similar counterparts in the modern toponymy. So what I've listed are the old spellings, the, the 10th century spellings uh, of those place names. But as you can see, they broadly circle the two candidate sites that we've been talking about. So we are very sure that we're in the right region, but unfortunately, uh, unless we find some uh, previously unrecorded uh, name of one of these sites that could approximate Sangoran, we won't be able to precisely nail it down. But we are without doubt within the right region. And if uh, we begin discussions about where the Sangoran inscription originated from, uh, this is uh, this is the region that we have to focus on. And having mentioned what the text contains, I want to emphasize that as of yet, the text itself is not properly established. So while there is an addition, uh, it is not it has not yet been it has not yet been worked to an extent that uh, we can be fully reliant on what's available. A little bit of the history of research on this inscription, which has been available for research to Western scholars, at least since uh, 1813, theoretically, 1812, in fact, those efforts were numerous, but they did not give a reliable reading for various reasons. In the early period, because uh, scholarly understanding of the old Javanese language was not yet developed, it was still in its infancy. And later on, because there was not easy access to the stone directly, uh, but scholars were reliant, including Brandes, so including to the first complete edition that was published in Brandes's uh, canonical publication of old Javanese inscriptions, reliant on photographs and eye copies rather than direct ins inspection of the stone. And due to the quality of those particular photographs, uh, Brandes's edition is replete with gaps, uncertainties, question marks that had to be corrected in a small way and on certain, on certain topics such as the date or the Sanskrit opening by subsequent scholars, but has never been fully revised. Brandes did not furnish his editions with any translations. And in fact, the stone was not completely translated, at least in published form, until H.P. Sarkar's corpus of old Javanese inscriptions, which furnished an English translation, but because he was still reliant on Brandis's readings and the lacunae that were present there, uh, unable to give a fully comprehensive interpretation and rendition of the text. Through our research, we found reference to readings by subsequent scholars, um, such as uh, the Japanese Kozo Nakada, and the Indonesian scholar Hassan Jafar. Uh, we haven't been able to find any published versions of those uh, readings or translations, uh, nor, nor in fact have we been able to find unpublished versions. So if they have been completed, which is possible, uh, they certainly remain unpublished and definitely not easily accessible. So the point is that, uh, that after uh, a relatively long period of the stone being known, we do not yet have a published edition or translation that is reliably based on directly inspecting the stone. And we can reflect on the reasons why this is the case. Um, there are many reasons, it's not just one culprit, but this is a situation that we face. And, I, and our primary aim uh, in my research and, and that of my colleagues is to make such, uh, such a work available to the general public. So in our efforts to do so, we visited Minto uh, in the middle of last year, uh, and a nice, uh, nice summer day. In uh, thanks to the generosity of uh, of the um, Earl of Minto himself uh, in making the stone available to us, we focused on two things. Firstly, reading the stone directly and and preparing a new edition, and secondly, taking high quality, uh, well, creating a high quality reproduction of the stone that could be used for future research. So this is why I chose uh, the term fresh eyes for the title of my talk, because thanks to the assistance of our colleague, uh, Adeline Le Vivier, uh, we were able to focus on developing 3D reproductions. So 
it's throughout the history of this inscription and in, in general through uh, epigraphy in general, scholars have always relied on reproductions. It's very, very rare for, a st for any inscription to only be read uh, by eye unless it's particularly um, particularly clear. So particularly for, so, so for a stone like Sangoran, uh, we indeed rely on cross-checking our inspection with certain different kinds of reproductions. As I mentioned, the early reproductions were challenging to use and resulted in a lot of question marks. Now uh, we have new tools available. Uh, the use of 3D modeling in particular is useful for inscriptions of this kind, those which are bulky and have, and have a significant amount of depth uh, discrimination. In order to capture this, we're able to use a relatively simple system of taking a, a large number of high quality photographs from different angles and then processing them to create a 3D model such as the one you see here. And this isn't obviously not the actual color of the stone, but I've applied uh, a filter in order to draw out the features ever more clearly. So here in the second panel and second image, we see how the object can be rotated and zoomed with the depth differences highlighted. So this really helps us when we're not certain of a particular reading and we can't see it clearly with our own eye to check ourselves and to double check our readings and also to easily compare with others. So by creating these digital images, it's not necessary uh, to go back to Scotland every time uh, in order to double check what we may have seen. It's not necessary also to attempt to use photographs, which for reasons of lighting uh, might not actually show depth differences as clearly as a 3, 3, 3D model can. So certainly we're not putting aside any of the old methods of reproduction, but we find that for many cases, this sort of 3D modeling can give us a new perspective and a new vision into the inscriptions. So we happily are able to offer some advances, some improvements to the readings that have already been published. Uh, and that's primarily thanks to uh, firstly, the opportunity to see the stone in person and to make an on the spot reading, but secondly, and perhaps more importantly, due to the quality of the 3D reproductions that we have been able to create. So here we focus on a passage which lists the uh, the victuals, the provisions that were offered to the guests, which were, who were numerous uh, and mostly from uh, from areas around Sangoran, uh, in order to celebrate the demarcation, the declaration that Sangoran would now become a benefice for the temple. So we have here a range of uh, terms that, so the, the, the readings in yellow, as you can see, are those which were absent in Brandis or were incorrectly read in Brandis, largely absent. Uh, and you can see here that some of them are quite significant. Uh, names of types of food, uh, types of animal uh, that were eaten, and um, and even even spe specifications about the total number of servings and the and the types of ingredients within them. If we look in our English translation, which uh, is almost uh, almost at a kind of advanced or, or complete stage, but nevertheless with some work to do still, there are certain terms which are still not clear uh, to us or to anyone. Uh, technical terms about the kinds of dressed up rice. Um, the term gangan is quite obscure. Uh, questions about whether in Japan in Japan refers to some sort of dessert or, or some sort of manner of serving rather. Uh, these questions remain open. If we look in the old Javanese dictionary of Zutmulda, they're very much uh, not touched upon or uh, have many question marks attached to them. So even with an inscription as well known as Sangoran, there are still many mysteries of interpretation. And so with the, that's why I emphasize the fact that we have very far from done in terms of reading, translating, and interpreting these things, uh, and all the more reason that uh, we should play close, pay close attention to the sorts of possibilities that uh, we have when looking at these materials with fresh eyes. So certainly, we very much invite ongoing engagement with the the linguistic side, particularly the lexicography and the and uh, the terminology 
of inscriptions, which is something which uh, is still very much in development in old Javanese history. But speaking of history, I just want to draw attention to some of the broader implications uh, of this stone. I mentioned that it was it's considered to be a boundary marker between the East Central Javanese period and the Eastern Javanese period, as shown in this map. And it is associated with the so-called volcanic catastrophe theory of Javanese history, wherein a previously flourishing Central Javanese civilization and kingdom was destroyed through a volcanic eruption and moved or fled to East Java. And this is a, a theory which has general currency. It's certainly not universally accepted. Um, and I myself find it extremely problematic. But this is nevertheless something which is well known in Indonesian historiography. We find in the Sangoran inscription, which is from Wawa's reign, so from the predecessor of Sindok, that there is almost total administrative continuity, that the ministers that are listed in the Sangoran inscription as being under Wawa are almost identical to those of the subsequent years under Sindok. So if it is the case that Wawa was the last king of the central Javanese period and Sindok was the first of the East Javanese period, and that between their two reigns there was a great catastrophe, that is not reflected at all in the per the perseverance and the continuity of the administration, which I find to be a relatively implausible scenario. Uh, so in that sense, the Sankaran inscription does belie the well-known uh, theory. Another important aspect of historiography is the notion or the terminology of Madang. This is something which has been debated really since the 1930s about exactly what the term Madang, which appears in inscriptions, means. And what we find or what we argue uh, in our forthcoming work on this inscription is that contrary to the standard view, particularly promulgated by de Kasparis, that Madang was uh, a name which moved around, that many palaces were called Madang because it was associated with the political entity of the kingdom that moved from central to East Java. And that assumption is also reflected in this map uh, on Wikipedia, uh, which has the name Mataram and then Madang in brackets, implying that Madang and Mataram are two different names for the same political entity, which spanned both East and central Java. Uh, we find that, in fact, rather, that the Sangaran inscription supports the notion that Madang was a place in central Java where the state originally was located, but which it later abandoned for other locations. And so if these revisions hold, then it implies that Sindok may not have been in fact the first king based in East Java. And that the notion of the central East Javanese uh, periodization will need to be reconsidered. So to conclude, and this is my final slide, uh, we know about the Minto stone, also known as the Sangaran inscription, largely in my view due to its colonial history, its unusual position as, an, as a Java inscription that has gone a very long way from its home. But as I hope to show, its contents are not so well known and are relatively little studied. So we still don't, for example, have access to an easily available translation of, this, of the contents of the stone into Indonesian. In order to gain knowledge of these things, we need to be able to read the script and the language. And our view is that those skills and that access is just as significant uh, as an intangible cultural heritage, access to the ancient language of, of Javanese history is just as significant as the tangible objects themselves. And without access to that knowledge, those interpretations will not be able to move forward. Importantly, though, the tangible does matter. Without access to the stone or and reliable reproductions of it, such as those that we've been trying to produce using different techniques, the study can't progress either. So we see here, uh, for example, a replica that has been created by the community at Gandat, so one of the places where the stone is believed to have come from. Uh, as part of their identification with the stone and its origin, they've created a replica, uh, but because they lack access to the original stone itself, what they've, in order to inscribe it, they have drawn on the published text of Brandis, uh, with, which itself was not 
of course, based on the stone itself, but rather of photographs of the stone. So here we have an, uh, the, re the replica is therefore mediated in a number of ways through, uh, through reproduction. Uh, and there's an area in which with new reproduction or with access, whether physically or digitally to the stone, uh, replicas such as these can be, um, can be developed uh, and can be made more uh, drawn closer to the originals uh, which they attempt to replicate. So we hope uh, as authors, as, as scholars, that the many important discussions around the repatriation of objects like this uh, will continue to focus on also the ancient context in which they emerge uh, and the importance of being able to, to connect with that uh, old history, with the old cultures uh, of which these objects are a part through the process of learning the languages, learning the scripts, and making the objects accessible as broadly as possible so that those processes of learning can continue to progress unhindered. So with that, I thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, Joe, for that. Very fascinating presentation. Thank you. Uh, and we'll take a couple of minutes uh, for questions uh, before our tea break. Does, does anybody have a question or make questions? Alex. Thank you. Uh, Jara, thank you so much for your very, very fascinating presentation. Uh, I'm just wondering you, uh, uh, whether there's a possible visualization of the text in the form of relief in the nearby temple. Thank you very much for that question. Um, there has been uh, there have been excavations of the Pundam site in particular. I think in twenty twenty uh, by an archaeological team from Malang, uh, which we were not personally involved in. That was something that was already ongoing when we began our research, uh, and it does show a significant site in that location. In fact. Some have already begun to label that site uh, Chandi Mananjung, based on the term Mananjung that appears in the Sangharan inscription, so a specific identification. We don't have anything more significant or more specific than that to tie the Sangharan inscription to that site. Unfortunately, because we haven't been able to figure out exactly where the, the stone was found, it may well have been physically located at that site. Um, but there's also the contention by the community at Gandat that it was instead in Gandat. If you can see, if you remember the map that I showed, there's a distance of about 1.5 to 2 kilometers between those two locations. So the archaeology does show that without a doubt, there was significant archaeological activity in this period. Uh, I note that from my understanding of the archaeological report from the, the Pundam site, that most layers were were 13th century or so, with maybe only the bottom layer around the 10th century, but I have to say that's just yeah, going off memory. Um, so, uh, so we'd have to go back and consult with those scholars about precisely what they found and to what extent we can link them. So yes, certainly we know there's stuff going on there. We're pretty sure that in some way or other, Sangoran and Mananjung were connected to those sites, but unfortunately we haven't been able to be more specific than that.